three social scientists from the University of Bremen have determined that social inequality likely magnifies the perception of risk in a pandemic, in this case, the novel coronavirus pandemic. The pandemic broke out in China in December of 2019, and over the next few months, it spread to the rest of the world. The figure demonstrates the logged number of deaths per country with an 18-day lead. This gives a rough indicator of the severity of the outbreak by country. The pandemic has an impact on risk perceptions among populations. It directly increases the likelihood of death or health conditions as a result of COVID-19. However, it also impacts social, economic, and psychological risks. The pandemic provides a unique opportunity to study human behavior and societies. Capitalizing on this opportunity, a team of researchers led by Andreas Lieberoth at Aarhus University in Denmark fielded the COVID eye stress survey. They attempted to gauge the psychological impacts of the pandemic on individuals across the world. The Bremen researchers were able to use responses to the COVID eye stress survey from the end of March through the end of April to investigate risk perceptions across 74 countries. This particular period marked major growth in the pandemic. As of March 15th, 174 out of 188 countries still had no deaths from COVID-19. One month later, this number was reduced to 51, and by May 1st, it was only 37. The researchers in Bremen were only able to study 74 of these countries due to data limitations. These were countries that had at least 20 respondents or more. Respondents to the COVID eye stress survey answered a battery of questions about how concerned they were about the consequences of the coronavirus for themselves, their family, their close friends, their country, and other countries across the globe. Using multi-group confirmatory factor analysis, the principal investigator of the Bremen team, Nate Bresnow, was able to demonstrate that three of the questions demonstrate reasonable measurement properties across countries. That means that the first three questions measure personal risk perceptions. Risk perceptions should reflect the actual level of social risks in a society. Now, social inequality has been shown to increase personal and social risks. For example, societies that are more unequal tend to have a higher poverty rate and tend to have more severe consequences for being in poverty. Social inequality has also been shown to have a negative impact on public health, increase crime, reduce social trust and social solidarity, and in some cases shown to decrease social mobility. Risk perceptions provide important insights into human societies. In several theories of human behavior, risk perceptions are the basis for decision-making. Risk perceptions can also have an impact on mental health, and they reflect modern theories of society, which suggest that the social hierarchy is determined by the level of risk that individuals are exposed to. Under conditions of heightened risk perceptions, individuals may engage in unhealthy behaviors or even socially detrimental behaviors such as avoidance or unnecessary risk seeking. This is how the Bremen team came to their research question, whether inequality increases risk perceptions in a pandemic. The pandemic heightens risk perceptions for everybody on average, but it also highlights many issues facing societies, many of which are related to social inequality. The situation of the pandemic due to health and economic effects puts a heavy burden on the social security and safety nets already present in societies, not to mention how effective governments are at reacting to a pandemic. Therefore, it's possible that societies that are more equal, that have larger social safety nets or more social solidarity, for example, are less concerned about the virus. And this might explain what the Bremen researchers refer to as the Swedish paradox. Sweden had quite a large outbreak of the virus early on, and yet Swedes were some of the least concerned in the world about the virus. In order to investigate if risk perceptions are a function of social inequality, 
The Bremen team started with a simple theoretical model where the severity of the outbreak locally causes risk perceptions. This can be captured in a regression of risk perceptions on days since the curve inflection, meaning how many days it was since the peak infection rate, and if a society hasn't reached that yet, the value is zero, new cases in the past week, whether that's increasing or decreasing, and the severity of government intervention. Like any regression model, this will not perfectly predict risk perceptions. Some societies will be underpredicted and other societies will be overpredicted in the level of risk perceptions. Therefore, the next step is to try to explain these residuals using measures of social inequality. Two in particular are selected. The first is disposable income inequality measured with the Gini. This is really the main test variable because it measures how much actual cash each person or family has to spend each month. A second measure, which is more of a robustness check, is the top 1% income concentration. Unfortunately, these data are only available in pre-tax format, so they do not take into account the welfare state and the tax system. Additionally, there are other explanations that are possible for risk perceptions. One of them is the strength and coverage of the welfare state, and another one is simply the wealth of a given society. This can be measured from the GDP per capita. Furthermore, some robustness checks are put into place to test the robustness of the findings. The data used by the Bremen team came from a variety of sources. During the pandemic, these sources have provided testimony to the power of open access and open data sharing. For example, the COVID I stress survey was posted in real time to the open science framework for any researcher to work with. The main results are presented in five regression models. M1 is simply the severity of the outbreak locally. Again, this model includes days since the peak of the curve, since the curve inflection, or as people like to say, since we flattened the curve. The number of new cases in the past week, whether it's increasing or decreasing, and the severity of the intervention by the government. This model explains about 20% of the variance in risk perceptions across these 74 countries. And then in model two, M2, disposable income inequality is introduced into the equation. This has a positive significant effect. It's predicted to increase risk perceptions and it nearly doubles the adjusted R squared. So it is a very powerful predictor of risk perceptions across these 74 societies. Now, as a counter argument, M3 looks at the strength of the welfare state, and this has a reducing impact on risk perceptions. Where there's a stronger welfare state with more coverage, there is lower risk perceptions, net of the local outbreak. M4 does the same thing, but this time for GDP per capita. The coefficient is not significant, but it points in the directions of lower risk perceptions. Finally, in M5, all three variables are put together to test counterfactually which one has more explanatory power, and disposable income inequality is the only one significant out of all three. Now, this model should be taken carefully because it has six variables in a regression with only 74 cases. Looking at the model statistics, we can see that the AIC is lowest by far in M2, as the same is true for the log likelihood. This indicates that M2, if selected from these five models, would be the model of choice. Just to provide context for the effect of disposable income inequality, as a standardized effect, this has a size of about 0.5. In a follow-up analysis, the research team put together a regression only on the residuals predicted from model one. This gives the maximum explanatory power to the severity of the outbreak, what causally should be the most important factor in risk perceptions. This is a conservative estimate of the effect of income inequality. 
Nonetheless, in this regression model, income inequality maintains a large significant positive effect. And again, it explains 20% of the variance, this time in the regression residuals. The results of this residual regression are visualized in figure two. The audience is encouraged to draw their own conclusions from this figure. To put it simply, some societies appear to be over-concerned relative to the severity of the outbreak locally, whereas other societies are under-concerned and some are somewhere in the middle. Social inequality appears to explain a lot of the discrepancy between these societies. In this study, countries that had less than 20 cases were dropped from the analysis. Nonetheless, there are still several countries that have less than 50 cases and many with less than 100. For these low case number countries, uncertainty is higher. Statistically speaking, the standard error is larger. To check that uncertainty, or let's say random luck, isn't the reason that there's a significant effect found in the main regressions, the Bremen team simulated 2,000 data sets using the standard error and random normal distribution. What happened was in all 2000 analyses, the effect was positive and it was significant at P less than 0.015 in all 2000 reanalyses. And in 99.5% of the cases, the p-values were below 0.005. The average effect or the mean coefficient from all 2000 indicated by the red dotted line was slightly lower than the one observed in the main model, indicated by the blue dotted line, but the difference is negligible, and again, all effects are positive in direction, indicating that this is a robust finding. In previous research, the principal investigator, Nate Bresnow, found that the welfare state probably has an impact on risk perceptions, at least under certain conditions. Interestingly, these new findings by the team in Bremen would overturn this, or perhaps better said, expand it to say that the welfare state is only one piece of a larger puzzle of causal pieces indicated by social inequality. The simple conclusion of this study is that social inequality shapes risk perceptions. However, it's important to keep in mind that social inequality itself is not a cause. Social inequality is an indicator of myriad causes. For example, the degree of social security in a society the level of trust and solidarity. It relates to class and group conflict. It indicates general risk increases among the population. It also can indicate how strong elite interests are or even the degree of de-democratization that has taken place in a society. Some issues to keep in mind when thinking about these results is that the COVID I stress survey was an entirely online sample and this can come with its own biases. Moreover, no individual level estimates were possible. This had to do in part with the fact that about 20 to 30% of respondents in each country did not consent to the use of their own sociodemographic data. Of course, it's better to rely on the counterfactual power of multivariate regression estimates, but two cases come to mind to mention in conclusion. One of them is Sweden, where the outbreak was quite severe at this time. The risk perceptions were the lowest in the world on average, leading to what seems to be a Swedish paradox. However, Sweden at the same time is one of the most socially equal societies with a very large social safety net, and this could explain this seeming paradox. On the other hand is the United States with an outbreak severity roughly similar to that of Sweden, but risk perceptions were very high. And of course, the government does not provide the same level of social safety net, it varies by state, and the level of inequality is much, much higher among the highest in the rich democracies of the world. Thank you for your attention to this presentation. All replication materials are available via the Open Science Framework.